It's exciting times here at the Lamb's Chapel. And we are, we are grateful for the legacy that has been built. We're grateful for where we are going. And I'm grateful that I get to open the book of Ephesians with you today. Will you join me in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15? Going to look at about four verses today. Let me propose a scenario to you. What if you had a bank? And in this bank, every morning, you, you would wake up, you could check your account, and you would see accredited to you $86,000 every morning. Somebody's like, preach it. <laughs> I didn't know this was going to be that kind of service, Pastor Scott. Well, this is not a commercial. I'm just giving you a hypothetical. What if you had a bank every morning, your account had 86 grand in it? Now, no, carry, uh, no carrying of the balance from day to day. That zeroes out at the end of every day. But every morning, you start fresh, $86,000. What would you do? Well, if you're like me, you would withdraw every red cent every single day and spend it to your advantage. Amen? Amen. That's right. Well, let me tell you something, folks. You have such a situation. The name of that bank and the name of the currency in that account is time. Because every single one of us, every day, we have credited to our account 86,400 seconds. And you get to spend those seconds however you want. You can invest them wisely. You can squander them. But whatever you do with them, at the end of the day, they're gone. And the next morning, you get a fresh batch, 86,400 seconds to do whatever you want to do with that. And that is not contingent upon your background, your pedigree, your station in life, your geographical location. Okay, we all get the same amount. Now, monetarily, some of us might be wealthier than others. You've heard of income inequality. There is no such thing as time inequality. We all get 24 hours in a day. We all get 86,400 seconds in a day. So it's not a matter of how much time you have. It's a matter of how you spend it. And that is what we're going to talk about today. I want you to look with me, just give you the gist of this passage here, Ephesians 5. The Apostle Paul says in verse 15, he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise And here's the key verse right here, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. We live in an evil day. We got to make good use of our time. That's what we're going to look at today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing upon our time together here today, Lord, as we look to your word, may we be good stewards of this time. These few minutes that we spend together right now, may we listen, may we open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to what you have to say. May we apply what you want us to apply and we want to be good stewards of it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, depending on your personality, the most delightful or the most annoying comedic film in the history of movies is Groundhog Day. (laughs) Groundhog Day. We got a Groundhog Day fans in here. Now, we just went through Groundhog Day a few weeks ago. I love the movie Groundhog Day. That's the kind of personality I have. I I could be a little annoying. And so I love this movie. One of my favorite comedic actors, Bill Murray, is in it. And he plays Pittsburgh TV weatherman Phil Connors. And Phil Connors has a yearly assignment where he's got to go to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, to cover their annual Groundhog Day festivities. And he loathes this assignment because he's an elitist. He likes the big city. He doesn't like to go to this podunk little burg uh, with their silly little tradition. Because what they do is, now this is a real thing. If you go to Punxsutawney, they do this. They drag out their their, uh, town mascot, Punxsutawney Phil, who's a fat little groundhog, And they say he's the seer of seers. He's the prognosticator of prognosticators. And he speaks forth, supposedly, in groundhog ease, whether or not there will be six more weeks of winter. And so this fictional TV weatherman, Phil Connors, he goes to cover this event, and he can't wait to get uh, get that over with, to get back on the van, go back to Pittsburgh. But lo and behold, when he's about to hit the road, a winter storm moves into the area, closes down all the roads, and he's got to spend the night in this town that he cannot stand. Could it get any worse? Well, of course it can. Because he wakes up the next morning to discover that not only is he stuck, In Punxsutawney, he's stuck in a time warp. 
And he has to relive the same day over and over and over again and again and again. And he doesn't know why. All he knows is every morning he wakes up to the same stupid song on the clock radio, I Got You Babe by Sonny and Cher. (laughs) Which, depending on who you ask, is the very definition of hell. (laughs) And as he goes about this day over and over... It occurs to him there are no consequences. I just got to relive the same day so I can do whatever I want. And so he does things that are satisfying to him, he thinks. He, he robs an armored car, steals the money. He eats whatever fattening food he wants. He seduces a pretty girl. But then he realizes, because it's a movie, that the, the real moral here is to, to be a benefit, to be a blessing to those around you, to invest in others. And of course, as he makes these tweaks, these changes from day to day, to day to day to day, he finally figures out how to get the day right. Well, you and I don't have that luxury. We can't make tweaks and changes to the same day over and over and over until we get it right. If we want to get a day right, we pretty much have to nail it the first time. Now, here's the thing, and this is what the Apostle Paul knows in our text. He knows that because we are believers, Christians, we are children of light. And so as such, we have an advantage as we go into our days. We know things that the world does not know because of the enlightenment that we have as children of the living God. And that is the theme here as we go back into this text. Let's look at it from the top. In verse 15, Paul says, Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And so the first thing we're going to see in your notes is we're going to look at our foundation. Our foundation. Now, you recall we're in the walk section of Ephesians. We've heard Paul say, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He has said, walk in unity as Christians. Walk no longer like the Gentiles, like those pagan nations around you. He said, walk in love. Last week, he said, walk in light. You are children of light. And here, he says, walk wisely. How do you walk wisely? What is our foundation? He starts with this phrase, look carefully. Look carefully, all right? What does he mean by that? Does he mean, watch out? Is it a warning? Well, it's not so much a warning. It's more of an an acknowledgement of our reality that we need to be aware that we can look carefully because we are children of light. We are in the light. You can look carefully because you are no longer in the dark. If you said, look carefully to somebody who is in the pitch blackness of night, they they wouldn't know how to respond to that because they can't look carefully. It's dark. I can't see my hand in front of my face. And so that's how it is for the world because they are in the dark. You and I, as Christians, are not in the dark. We are in the light. And so we have the ability to look carefully. And the word here for look carefully, the root of that word in the Greek is akron. Akron, it means point. It means sharp. Okay, as in the point of a dart. If you're throwing darts, uh, you want to nail the center of that bullseye. You want to be accurate. Akron, you see, comes from the Greek. If something is sharp, has a sharp smell to it, we say what an acrid sense, a sense that comes from this word. Paul's point is exactly that. Have a point on your life. Be pointed. Live sharply. Have a point to what you are doing, where you are going, and keeping the will of God. And so the key to all of this in your notes is personal holiness. This is what it means to have a point on your life. You are walking in personal holiness. And so he gives us this warning. Look carefully. Look sharp. Because you can. Look about you. Protect the thing that is most important in your life. What's the most important thing in your life? It's your testimony. Your testimony is so important. It's so vital. Why? Well, number one, it's powerful. Number two, it's unique. Nobody's got a testimony like your testimony. It's one of a kind. Number three, it's important. It's valuable because it's so easy to damage. You ever, you ever run close to that? You ever get close to damaging your testimony? It's not hard. You can do it. That's why you got to look carefully. 
You need to look about you in your life that you are walking in holiness so you don't damage your testimony. Several years ago, I moved to Arkansas with my family. I became the lead worship pastor at a large church. They ran thousands in attendance. It was quite a contrast from the smaller churches that I'd been in. And there was a lot of pressure. It was a high stress environment. My lead pastor was a high powered guy. And we had just moved into a new house. And you know how that is when you move a new house. There's a lot to do. There's a lot of phone calls to make to set up utilities and get this service going, that service going. And I had limited time because of my load of responsibilities at this church. And I went home on my lunch break and I had to make it quick because I had a meeting to be at with my lead pastor. And so I'm trying to make calls so that my wife can function at home with the kids and all that. And my last call is to the water company. And I called the water company. We kind of lived in a rural area. And I called them. And, and this sweet little gal with an Arkansas accent picked up. She said, may I help you? And I said, yeah, I, I just got to make this deposit so I can get the water turned on. She's like, oh, yes, absolutely. I can help you with that. You just got to come on down here with a check and, for this amount. And we'll get that turned on for you. And I said, whoa, 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 check, check. No, 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 I got a credit card. I got a credit card right here. Can I just pay this over the phone? She said, no, I'm sorry. We're not set up for that. We're going to need you to come down here in person. I go, in person? I, you, I have to come down there? I got a meeting to get. To. My wife is across the room going, Grim, careful. You be careful. And I'm like, I, and I'm like wait, 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 hold on. You're saying I can't pay this over the phone? And, and I start to get a little heated and I start to lose my cool. Now, I know you've done this. Don't you judge me. <laughs> all right? You're all out there going... Pastor Scott. And I'm like, nah, you've done it too. So I'm on the phone, I'm getting worked up. And I'm like, I gotta go all the way. I got a meeting to be at. Are you telling me it's, this is the 21st century. What century are we in? Where are we living here anyway? Are we in, are we in some third world country? You know, and I'm kind of losing it because I'm stressed out and I'm getting short with her. And my wife is, you know, looking at me and all this stuff. And this little gal, she was so apologetic. She goes, I know it. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience, but we're just not set up for it any other way. You're going to have to come down here. I go, okay, okay, fine. I'll come down there. I'll take time out of my busy schedule and I'll come down and write you your little check. Where are you at? And she told me the address. I go, okay, I'll see you in a bit. And she goes, you bet. I'm so sorry for everything. Oh, by the way, aren't you the new lead worship pastor? <laughs> At First Baptist Church. And I said, why, yes, I am. Yes. Do, do, do you, do you? And my wife, I could feel the laser beams, man. I'm going, I said, do you, uh, do you, do you attend <laughs> the church? And she goes, oh, yes, I'm on the front row every week. Yeah, yeah, front row. And so I went down there with the check and some flowers and, uh, you know, some hush money. And, and that's how it is, right? You've been there. I know you've been there. But we've got to be cautious. We've got to look sharp. That's our foundation, personal holiness. And then number two in your notes, let's look at our exhortation. Our exhortation. This life of holiness is not merely for you and I to grow in our walk with God. It is to be transferred to the culture. We are to transfer the holiness of the Christian life into the culture. Paul says in verse 16, making the best use of the time. Making the best use of the time. Now, some of you have a translation that says redeeming the time. Does anybody have the word redeeming? All right, I actually think that is a better translation. I'll always tell you that when there's a better translation than what I'm reading from. Redeeming the time is the more literal translation. And as far as time goes, there's a word in the Greek that is often used for what we consider time, the normal succession of moments. And it's the word chronos. Chronos, chronology, chronological, having to do with time. That, you would think, would be the word that Paul uses here. It's not. He uses a different word in the Greek. It's kairos, kairos, okay? And that does not mean the succession of moments. It means an age. That's what kairos means. So literally, redeeming the age, okay? We live in an age. We've talked about ages in here before. If you read the Bible, you will see there are periods of different ages throughout human history. 
Uh, very clearly in scripture, you've got the age of promise uh, where you had the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on. God's promise to that family that would uh, eventually become the nation of Israel. After that age, you've got the age of law, which is when Moses comes down from Sinai with the, the tablets. And this is an age in which the scriptures are introduced, the written scriptures and the prophets, you see. And so that age is the longest age of the Old Testament era. It comes to a conclusion, and then we had a new age kickoff, which is the age that we're currently in. We call it the age of grace, or the church age, and we're in it right now. And so this is a parenthesis in between the death, burial, and uh, resurrection and ascension of Jesus and his coming when he returns to this earth to establish a kingdom, which is going to be the next age. How many of you know that the age we're in is not the last age? There's another one beyond this. Have you read the back of this book here? Is there another age coming? There is. It's the kingdom age. And so we are in the age uh, in between the end of law and the beginning of the kingdom. And we have a job to do. And in your notes, we've got to embrace the mission. The mission of this age. He says, redeem the age. That is your mission. To redeem this time. Why do we need to redeem it? Paul says, because the days are evil. Do we live in an evil day? Is there evil going on here? It needs to be redeemed. The word for redeem is uh, exagerazzo. Exagerazzo. And that's a word that is used for salvation in some texts. It pertains to, to saving Someone. The middle part of that word, exagorazo agora. Agora refers to the marketplace in Paul's day. That's where they would take slaves and they put them on the block and they would get auctioned off. People would buy slaves at the agora, at the market here. Now, understand that when a slave went on the market, they're already slaves, they're already in bondage. And exagorazo carries the implication of someone purchasing a slave in order to change their situation for the better, to buy them out of bondage, the horrific bondage that they were in. Now they serve a good master, okay? And so this is the idea when we talk about what God did for you and for me. He purchased us out of the bondage of sin by the blood of Christ, we were bought, and now we are the property of God. He is our master, and so we are bond servants. We are slaves to God. But to be a slave to God is to live in freedom. Amen. That is freedom. We are not in bondage to sin. Sin is a harsh master. God, God gives us a life of freedom because we belong to him. And so what, what Paul has done is he's taken this concept and he's applied it uh, to the way that we spend our days that we redeem the time, that we take moments that are corrupted and enslaved to the prince of this world and we bring them under the authority of Christ so that there is freedom and we walk in that, all right? And then the third thing that I wanna show you in your notes, let's look now at our preparation. How do we prepare to do this mission, to execute this mission? In verse 17, Paul says, therefore, do not be foolish, do not be foolish. He started this text saying, don't walk as unwise. This is not just a repetition of that. This is an exhortation under the verse that we just read, verse 16. He's saying, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Don't float downstream with the rest of the human debris. Don't just go along with everything else that the world is doing. Whenever you see a riot on television... Uh, just know this, there is a small contingency in the middle of that mass of humanity that is being disruptive, that is, that is violent, that is vandalizing, that is looting, that is hurting people, etc. There is a small contingency that, that went into that with full knowledge of what they were about to do. They were intentional and they are seeking to disrupt. The rest of those people are just going along. They are followers, they didn't intend to do it, but they are there and they are just, you know, they're just doing, they're lemmings. They're doing what everybody else is doing. They're fools, you see, according to Scripture. And we see that behavior throughout mankind. Christians are not to be that. And not just in a riot situation, but in all areas of life, in all of these paradigms of society, we don't just go along with what the world says. Don't be 
foolish, Paul says, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be a fool. Understand what the will of the Lord is. So in your notes, you got to understand truth because you can. You can in a way that the world cannot, okay? Understand right and wrong. We all have an awareness of right and wrong. We got it from the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, because Adam ate of that tree, passed it on to us, we all have some awareness of right and wrong. Paul says this is not just an awareness of truth. This is an understanding of truth. It's a deep understanding that you apply to life. Don't be like the culture. You are called to, to that which the culture has no understanding. See, uh, the, the essence of this verse, don't be foolish, understand what the will of the Lord is, is not simply don't do what the culture is doing. It's do what the culture ought to be doing that it doesn't know how to do. That's what we're called to understand the will of the Lord. Anybody want to know the will of God? Is that a good thing to know? You guys want to know the will of God? Yes. Guess what? You can. Where do you find the will of God? You find it in the word of God. The will of God is found in the word of God. There's an assumption the Bible makes that because we have this revelation, this spiritual document, and not only that, we as Christians, as children of light, are indwelled with the spirit of the living God. And therefore, because we are indwelled with the spirit, we can look at a spiritual document and we can discern it by the power of the spirit. You have the potential to know God's will. But if you're not in his word, you will never know God's will. You will never understand the will of God because that's where you find it and you discern it by the spirit. And we use what we learn there to critique our world, to discern in our world, okay? And some of you are saying, well, I read the Bible and I still don't know what the will of God is. Well, then get around some other believers to study the Bible with you because just like you have the spirit, they have the spirit. Maximize the influence, uh, uh, the divine influence that God has on you by surrounding yourself with growing Christians who are spirit-indwelled, spirit-filled believers and study this spiritual document called the Bible together. And don't just ask each other what we all think. What's your opinion? What's your opinion? No, go to the word together and discern together. Don't just pull your ignorance. Anybody can do that. But we look at that which is timeless with those who are indwelled with that which is timeless. And then we take what we learn and we lay it as a grid over every area of life. We look at marriage. Are marriages in trouble today? They are. And so we put the grid of God's word over that to see what, how God wants marriage to be seen. What about parenting? Could we use a little help with parenting today? Do we look to the world for that help or do we put the grid of the Bible over parenting to understand how we should raise children? We absolutely do. What about sex? How do we learn about sex? We go to Hollywood for that? We look to pop culture, pop music, all of the things? No, we look at what God's word says about it and we study that together and we are transformed by what we read. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, okay? How are you transformed? By reading the word. Your mind is renewed by the truth that is in his word that you discern by the spirit, and that by testing, how do you test it? You weigh it against the word. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God. Where is the will of God? It's in his word. It's in his word. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. There is a plumb line of right and wrong in life, in love, in marriage, in finances, in parenting, in leadership, everything. It's all about understanding what the will of God is. And so we who are enlightened, who have the spirit living within us, we go to this endless well of truth, the word of God, and we apply it in areas of life and we impact our culture because we live in an evil day. It's an evil day. It's a dark day. And what, what makes it so evil? So many things. So many. We, we live in a day with a drug culture, a heavy drug culture. I had a friend that did prison ministry. And I asked him some time back, I go, tell me about your work with the, with the prison ministry. I go, what, most of the people that you work with in those prisons, what are they in for? He goes, drugs. I go, really? He goes, I don't know what people 
used to do to get sent to prison before drugs became so prevalent. Because it's almost everybody, like well over half of the people in prison are there because of some kind of drug-related thing. You're either buying them or selling them or using them or stealing them or you're stealing money to buy them or you get thrown in prison for what you did while you were on them. But we've got a drug culture and, and the world has no idea what to do about it except legalize it. Because there, there you go, that solves the problem. Just make it legal. Therefore, no more drug crime. It's all legal. Brilliant. Brilliant. We've got a substance abuse problem. We've got a secularism problem in our, is this a secularist day, a godless day? We have a school, we've got a private Christian school through this church, Grace Christian Academy. Why do we have it? Because of secularism run amok. You know, there didn't used to be that many private Christian schools in America. You know why? You didn't need them. Because there was at least a semblance of understanding of right and wrong in the world. That, those days are long gone. Long gone. We don't know anything anymore as a people. We don't know right and wrong. It's all subjective. It's whatever feels good to you. It's whatever you think is right. Uh, you know, I, we don't even know what men and women are distinctly anymore. We can't, we, we can't tell people anything apart from the word of God. And so we, we have to have a standard uh, in the area of counseling. That has changed over the years. It used to be that you would go to counseling. You, you would have a problem. You'd talk, sit down with a counselor and you'd say, well, here's what I'm going through and here's what I've been doing. It's not working. And the counselor would say, oh yeah, that doesn't work. You need to do this. And they'd counsel you. This is the way you should go. That, that was counseling. No more. Now counseling is uh, just a lot of listening and a lot of questions and you don't really get instructed to do anything correctly, okay? And you, you, know, you go and the guy's like, well, I, I am so miserable. And the counselor's like, yeah, I can see that. What do you think that is? I don't know. I'm just miserable. Yeah, I agree. That'll be $300. <laughs> yeah. We, we, our world is very vague. It's very nebulous. We've got to have a compass. We need a standard. And so we need to impact the world with the truth that we are receiving in order to change the world, to change the culture, okay? But we do it based on who, what the change that he's done in us, and we have to be salt and light in our culture, okay? We do what is right, okay? Verse uh, number four in your notes, uh, we, we're gonna look at our action. This is our action. This is what we are being called to do specifically. Verse 18, Paul says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, there's a little bit of humor here, a little bit of humor here. Uh, this verse is popularly used, and I grew up Southern Baptist. I grew up in an environment where by the thimble or by the barrel, alcohol was wrong. Okay, that's, that's what we were taught. Uh, now, I, I can't go that far with Scripture. What I can tell you without a doubt is that Scripture forbids drunkenness. It forbids intoxication. And this verse seems to affirm that. But this is not the verse to use to affirm that because it's deeper than that. Paul is going somewhere deeper here. He says, don't be drunk with wine. That is debauchery. Now in your, in your version, it may say to excess. That is to excess. What is this word for debauchery? Uh, being drunk with wine. Uh, you may have heard a word in English, a slang word. Have you ever heard the word sot? That guy's a sot. What a sot. Look at that sot. What, what, what is a sot? A sot is somebody who is just constantly inebriated. They're just always sloshed, all right? Well, that word comes from the Greek word here for debauchery, asotia, asotia, sotia. And so the root of that word is shared with another Greek word, uh, soteria, soteria, uh, we, we mean salvation. Soteriology is the study of salvation. Soter is savior in Greek, okay? So they share a root. Asotia, debauchery, has the same root as soteria, salvation. Now, stick with me here. The prefix on asotia, ah, what does that prefix ah mean? It means no. No. An atheist, atheos, no God. Okay, so 
Asotia means no salvation. No salvation. And the, the image that is presented here is that someone who is totally given over to excess and drunkenness and intoxication, that is a picture of the opposite of salvation. To, the opposite of salvation is lostness, a perpetual state of being wasted. And that is the term that we use when we refer to somebody who's always intoxicated. They look at them, they're so wasted. And we mean that figuratively, but there's a literal connotation to that too. We talk about the potential of that life. Man, that guy could be all world. That lady, she's, she's just got such a great personality. Look what they could be. Look what they could accomplish. But they are, they're throwing it down the drain. What a waste, we say. And so he's got this play on words. Don't get drunk with wine. That is debauchery. But what? Be instead filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. That is a phrase, if you look at all the epistles in the New Testament, you don't see it again. It's just right here. This is it. You go Romans to Jude, that phrase will not appear. But you go back to the narratives of the gospel, you see Zechariah. He is filled with the Spirit. And when he's filled with the Spirit, what does he do? He opens his mouth and he prophesies the truth of God, the Word of God. It comes out of him. He's prophesying about his son, John, as in John the Baptist, who would do what? Point to the Messiah. Point to Christ. And if you look at the book of Acts, this phrase, be filled with the Spirit, you see this 10 times in Acts. And nine out of 10 times, what happens when someone is filled with the Spirit? They open their mouth and they speak forth what? The gospel. And people respond and they get saved. They come to faith in Christ. So to be filled with the Spirit has a direct connotation of being a witness for Christ. That is what someone who is filled with the Spirit does. Paul makes it clear that to be filled with the Spirit is the way you redeem the time. And what you do when you are filled with the Spirit is you proclaim the gospel. You evangelize. You share Christ. You open your mouth. And with moral courage in an evil day, you speak forth the truth of God. And you point out sin and you call it out for what it is. You say, that's sin. Christ died for that sin. You are characterized by that sin, but because Christ died for it, you can put faith in what Christ did and you can be forgiven of that sin. And that is the message that the world needs to hear in a dark and evil day. And so this notion of the Holy Spirit is not a very broad idea. When you are filled with the Spirit, you are someone that speaks forth the truth of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you redeem the time in this darkened age by penetrating the hearts of people with the gospel of Christ. And this has always been the case. If you go back to the dawn of this age, the dawn of this age, at the very beginning, this has been the rule. Share the truth of Christ. Share the hope of Christ. Redeem the time. Acts chapter 1. Verse six is where we start. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. He's there with his disciples. He's already risen from the dead. He's spent some time with them. He's about to ascend to the Father. And they're on the Mount of Olives. And these Jews, these, these disciples, they say to him when they'd come together, they say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now, Lord? Why are they asking him that? Because they're good Jewish boys. They've read their Bibles. They know the prophets. They know Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah one day would set foot on the Mount of Olives and would then proceed to establish the kingdom. And so they're looking around. They're going, hey, guys, we're on the Mount of Olives. There's the Messiah, Jesus. He just rose from the dead. Is this, is this it? And so they're saying, Lord, is it now? Is it now? Is it now? Are we there? Are we there? Are we about to go down, you and I, and we destroy the Romans and you establish your kingdom? Is that happening right now, God, Lord? And he says to them in verse seven, it is not for you to know times or seasons. Hey, what word do you think he uses for times? Kairos. It is not for you to know the ages or the seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. Yes, I'm coming back. Yes, I'm going to establish my kingdom. But only God the Father knows when that will be. He has fixed that time. He alone is privy to that. 
uh, you are not. Can we know the time? We can't, and we won't, so we don't. But we know this, we are in this age right now. First of all, are you excited that the Lord is gonna come back one day? Are you glad about that? Okay, I am too, but guess what? We got a job to do right now. We got a mission to fulfill right now because we're in the parenthesis. We're in that gap between his ascension and his second coming and there's a whole lost world out there right now and they're gonna miss the next time and we gotta bring the gospel to them. It's not for you to know the seasons but then guess what he says to them in verse eight of Acts one. It's called the Great Commission. It's another Great Commission passage and he says, but you will receive Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And you need to know something. That commission was not just for those 11 disciples on that mount. It's for you and me too. Because we've got a Jerusalem. It's called Burlington. It's called Alamance County. We've got a Judea, it's called North Carolina. We got a Samaria, it's called the United States of America. And the ends of the earth are everything past those borders and we have the same calling that these disciples did. You're here but for a limited time, boys. You don't know how long I could come back tomorrow. Get her done. Get her done. And so what do we do in your notes? We preach the gospel. You say, well, I'm not very eloquent. Neither was Moses. Neither was Peter. And yet, what did God use Peter to do? He opened his mouth, filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He spoke forth the gospel. 3,000 people came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. You have no idea what God can use you to do. Open your mouth. Trust the Lord. He, He says, I'll take care of the rest. Because he told those disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Uh, If you're a Christian, you're not waiting for that to happen. You've already got them. You've already got them. You don't get more of them. You say, well, I'm indwelled with the Holy Spirit, but am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, I don't know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, but here's the deal. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't get more spirit. He gets more you. So you just say, I'm yours, Lord. Use me. And you leave the rest to him. And you don't be worried about the effects or the impact that you're going to have. You just be faithful in a limited time when you've got a job to do, when you have a calling on your life, you be responsible for the moment that he has placed you in. And you share the hope that is within you with the people that you work with, with the people that you live with, your family members that don't know the Lord, the people that you go to school with. Wherever you are, you've got this obligation and you just open your mouth and you share the hope that is in you. Because the question we need to ask is this, in your notes, will the time you have left be wasted or redeemed? We gotta redeem the time because it all belongs to him. What is it you're doing right now that's more important than what God wants you to be doing in the season that you have in this world? Let's pray. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I'm gonna ask those who are coming this morning to be baptized and those helpers if they'll make their way down here right now. But as we bow in prayer, I would like to give the rest of you an opportunity to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Pastor Scott, I'm I'm not able to look carefully about me because I'm in the dark. I know in my heart I'm not a child of light. I know that I have never trusted Christ. And I'm ready right now. I'll give you an opportunity to do that right now. We had people in our last service that made a decision that is gonna change the rest of their life. It's the most important decision that they ever made. Where you are right now with nobody looking in the privacy of your heart, if you are saying that I need Jesus to be Lord and master of my life, I need him to purchase me out of the bondage of sin that I'm in. I need a point on my life. I need direction. If that's you today and you're willing to pray this and mean this from your heart for the very first time, I want you to join me right now. And please know it's not 
It's not these words. These are not magic words. It's not a formula that you pray that saves you. It's the sentiment of your heart. It's the surrender of your soul to God. It's your trust unequivocally in what Jesus did for you at Calvary, for your life, for your eternity. And you're gonna turn it over to him right now. If that's your decision, that's your heart, I want you to pray with me where you are along these lines. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that you died for me. You paid the price for me, a price I could not pay to give me the gift of salvation. It's something I could never earn. And I turn to you, Lord. You're my only hope. And I am giving you my life. I'm giving you my my entire being. I want to follow you. And I am trusting you for my eternity. Will you be my Lord? Will you be my Savior? I pray this in Jesus' name name every head remains bowed every eye is closed if you've just made that decision today to receive Jesus Christ into your life with nobody looking would you just slip up your hand and let us know that Hmm. amen amen I see that Thank you so much, Lord Jesus. I pray for these folks here today that have made the most powerful, important decision they've ever made. God, and I would invite each one of them to come down to the front at the end of our service today to talk with me, to talk with one of our prayer team, to share this decision. Because if it's a decision worth making, it's a decision worth telling somebody about. And Lord, we want to come alongside them to get them started in this amazing adventure. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Scott Graham, and we want to thank you for joining us as we reach, raise, and release genuine followers of Jesus Christ here at the Lamb's Chapel. Uh, If you want to know when a video drops or when we go live, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And send this video to someone who needs to hear it. And make sure you invite them to join you here with us live this week. We'll see you soon.